Create Lab Ventures is a social venture that creates new opportunities for the underserved community to enter the tech and media industries, especially in artificial intelligence. So with me today, Dr. Lee Goss, who's gonna be co-hosting with me, and also our guest, Abram Maldonado, co-founder of Create Labs, and also ambassador of OpenAI. So yes. welcome, great to have you here. Thank you for having me, good morning. So explain what is Create Labs, sure. what kind of services are you doing, and, and for who? Absolutely, uh, well thank you again for having me. Uh, we started uh, really as a social impact organization, really helping the community um, create those pipelines to get into tech and media and emerging industries uh, where we saw that there was a lack of a talent resource connecting the underserved community to learn those skills and get into those spaces. While doing that work, uh, we fell into the space of generative AI right at its inception around the creation of GPT uh, by OpenAI and we were tapped to, to join them as be the early beta testers of that technology and since that time, uh, going back now I guess three years, uh, we have developed to become the first, uh, one of the first uh, generative AI companies servicing enterprise and businesses to develop AI products for them to help them get into this space. As an ambassador, I support the organization testing these models, testing future models that aren't out yet, interfacing with the company, the engineering teams, the product teams to help them understand what are the different ways that people can leverage generative AI and, and where this is headed. So, uh, Great to have you here and excited to learn about this. AI is definitely a buzzword now and then generative AI yeah. adds a layer to that and I think a lot of people are speaking about it, but uh, I would love to hear from your perspective, what is generative AI? Generative AI relies a lot on predictive behaviors, taking a data set. So if you take the word uh, roses are, right? You build a data set to try and predict what do you want to hear after roses are? Do you want to hear roses are a flower? Roses are red? Um, roses smell good? So it's a whole data set to try and predict what do you want to hear next and then it learns as you reinforce it. So now expand that to image, expand that to video, right? You take a data set that takes millions of images and turns them into like grains of sand and to allow you to mold new images and new creations from its learned behaviors from that, that original data set. So it's generating, hence the word generative, it's generating new content from what you've provided it in, in its original data set. Interesting, and I had the privilege of watching some of your previous interviews and you mentioned bias yes. in AI. Yes. And uh, that was uniquely interesting to me, so I would love for you to explore that. Sure, it's something we care deeply about because, like I said, we worked in the social impact space prior to our work in AI and working closely as diversity consultants with tech companies to help them address bias in their business practices, their marketing, their hiring practices. So when we saw AI as another area to address bias, we took it head on. Um, hence our product DEI GPT, which is one of our uh, diversity products that we put out to the market leveraging AI. So in this, you take a snapshot of data, you take a slice of uh, the internet and put that into a large language model to then generate new text. Well, if that slice has bias in it, then inherently the new language model will also carry through that bias. So you have to address and really investigate what are we feeding this machine and is there bias in what we're feeding it? So a lot of these large language models, they capture Wikipedia content. People don't realize 87% of Wikipedia pages are made by white males. So if there's any bias in the Wikipedia pages that you're feeding these models, then that's gonna show up in the outputs as well. Unless you are going the extra mile to be more inclusive and representative in the data set or in what you're feeding it and making sure that it's being fed correctly. Mm. What ways do you see generative AI kind of incorporating into how we work and live? Well, at the basic level, you think about what are we, what are we doing manually so often uh, at work, you know, in our professional lives that maybe should be augmented or enhanced with AI. Spreadsheets, you know, writing proposals, mm -hmm. writing that, that repetitive email. You know, we forget how much time it takes to actually write an email and write an email that we've written a thousand times before. Maybe is there something that can predict how we've written that email in the past? to just tell it through a command, all right, send this person a follow-up email, send this person an intro email, send this person a thank you email, and it's like, you know what, I know how you've written these in the past, so let me take care of that for you. In our daily lives, 
you know, my children use it when they get stuck in a video game, when they need help with a math question. Um, personally, we have nine-year-old twins and a four-year-old. My children were stuck on a math question that even we couldn't figure out. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I were debating on what was the right answer for a third grade math problem. <laughs> so we went to ChatGBT and yeah. we were like, well, Chat, what do you think is the right answer? Just so me and my wife don't continue to, you know, fight in front of our children over a third grade math <laughs> problem. Yeah, so no. it helped. Yeah, that math gets difficult as it does. get older. We get right rusty. Now. <laughs> I've been there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been a while. The youth are going to be great at it. Uh, absolutely. Um, I guess my question is for people that are still in the workplace now, how can we keep up? How can we educate ourselves? How can we use AI to our advantage? Um, how, how do we fit into this? Well, each company uh, has different policies around adopting it, uh, whether it's banned, whether it's permitted. What you're seeing more and more of is a company say, you know what? We're going to train our own instance of a custom model that's trained in our data that you can use for internal purposes only, not public facing. That's usually the first baby step in. So that way, if you need any information, a lot of companies use like an internal um, wiki or uh, confluence you might see sometimes or an internal notion or Google Docs. And they'll say, um, I need to answer this question for a customer. Can you help me? And there's an internal chatbot that has learned all of the company's data, the products, product history, that can answer that question in a, in a second for you. So it's a great resource to have right at your disposal um, as you're doing your business. Um, from a content generation, when things are going public, that's where things get a little bit more tricky because everyone's so worried of this word hallucinations because sometimes it could just make up an answer. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not Siri or Alexa where it's gonna stop and say, you know what, I don't know the answer, cannot compute. It's a people pleaser. It's going to say, you know what, you want an answer, I'm going to give it to you, even if it's not real. Mm. Um, and that's where you have to make sure that there's proper guardrails and proper uh, preparation and how that was built to make sure that it minimizes those hallucinations before you point it to the public. Uh, learned a, a new word as it pertains to AI, hallucinations. Yeah, yes. no. I was wondering why maybe it's like <laughs> exaggerations or yeah. no, it's just... Flat just, out. Yeah, it's, just it's, flat out makes it up. Yeah, I've yep, heard of it's that. It's a common yeah. word now, hallucinations. So with your company, you're dealing with a lot of different companies and different areas of business, yes. and some disciplines are adopting AI quickly and others are more resistant. Yep. Uh, what are you seeing kind of as someone uh, at the forefront? Well, even those that are more resistant, they're saying to us, look, we want to take advantage of this technology. Let's keep it, what they say, off-prem, right? So let's have this built externally so it's not connected to our internal systems and let's test it in a testing environment and then once it's proven uh, safe and, and ethical and successful and, and we feel good about it, then maybe we'll start working it into our internal systems. Um, others, th there's a balance, right? Because there's, all right, let's just keep it in R&D, right? Let's keep it low stakes. Let's keep it you know, in the basement for now while we test it. While others are like, no, let's go to CES, let's make a big announcement, let's make a big splash because we want to show our customers that we're cutting edge and we're on pace with innovation and we're one of the innovative companies that are brave enough to take it full on. And when they want to keep up in that pace and that race to innovation, and if they don't have the resources in the house, then they call us and they're like, look, we, we can't, we're not fast enough, nimble enough to stay on pace with how this technology is moving mm -hmm. um, in-house with our internal teams and our internal resources. So Create Labs, why don't you come in and build it for us and we'll give you our needs and, and our business requirements and then you take it from there. Mm -hmm. So walk me through that process. Uh, how can a company reach out to Create Labs? What does that workflow look like? Sure, believe it or not, a lot of companies reach out through LinkedIn, through social media. Um, all of our business has been inbound. Um, so a lot of it, people just find our contact form on our website. Um, and I now, you know, in this last year, you know, carry another full-time role of being a, a keynote speaker on AI and the future landscape. Uh, so You're a lot fired. of fired. We're putting AI in your spot. Man. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not far behind. I'm not, They'll sure definitely be, I'm not sure if it's yeah, you. Yeah, this is an avatar. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Spoilers out. Um, so yeah, at the conferences, a lot of companies will reach out to me after the conference. They'll find you know, my contact on LinkedIn and say, hey, I love what you showed or demonstrated. Can we talk afterwards? And you know, can I explain to you our, our business use case and our problem that we need you to solve? But again, we are still a social impact organization. We don't monetize the social impact side of it. We, it's kind of baked itself into our DNA as we moved away from trying to 
you know, commercialize anything around our social impact work. So the team is black and brown founded. A lot of us came up into the AI space as a secondary career, you know, coming over with transferable skills from media and entertainment and education. Uh, so we're a, we're a ragtag bunch that's, you know, take on, taking on our bootstraps and, and run this company through our bootstraps to do a lot of really creative and interesting work uh, for other companies. And state industry agnostic. So we get clients from healthcare and fashion and entertainment and finance. Uh, just because we want to stay, you know, uh, with a wider range on how these technologies could be used. Yeah. Well, what's on the horizon for Create Labs? How do you envision using AI going forward? Sure. So, uh, this week is CES in Vegas, mm -hmm. and um, what you're seeing there is usually like a testing ground of people trying to take it to the next level. So this week you're seeing a lot of hardware. Mm -hmm. um, you're seeing a lot of people introduce little gadgets that are connected to APIs that call to AI chatbots. Whether or not that's going to stay, we'll see. We'll see how, how many people adopt. I bought one just to test them out. Um, but for us personally, another announcement that was just made uh, this week uh, is our partnership with MasterCard. So MasterCard is making a big investment around supporting small businesses and underserved entrepreneurs. And they asked us if we can build them a chatbot that can mentor these small businesses that are starting from scratch, day one, They've never gotten a bank loan before, they've never opened a business, and they want to know where do they start, how do they maintain, and how do they grow their business. And we're doing that through generative AI and building that chat out in partnership with MasterCard. So we're really excited about that. Definitely uh, congrats on the partnership Thank with you. MasterCard. Sure. Um, how are governments kind of reaching out to you? And uh, obviously you don't have to sure. mention any names, but no, is yeah, there? No, absolutely. Um, so I just spoke in Philly to the um, Hispanic Caucus of National uh, State Legislators, and it was a great meeting to demonstrate to them. One thing that I demoed was a city chatbot, a city trained, I called it City GPT, where I trained it on New York City's 311 system. And that way, there's a, a single endpoint that can interact with all of the city's services, social services. So if grandma on the 10th floor, who's 80 years old, her heat stops working, you know, can interact with a multilingual hmm. bot that understands what needs to happen at the city level instead of waiting on a phone, uh, instead of getting a, a robust city website with all these drop down menus to scroll down. You know, it's difficult. It's difficult to navigate that, especially if you are, you know, a secondary language. So having these tools that have learned everything about the city and what it has to offer from a city government standpoint um, to deliver that is, is the, the potential is, is untapped. There was just an announcement with uh, Pennsylvania where they're adopting ChatGPT at the enterprise level for internal purposes. So again, they're taking that baby step to use it internally to better understand their data. Um, but we've already tested and demonstrated to other cities what's possible with connecting it to not releasing another app. Just, I'm just talking about a single endpoint that's very easy, low hanging fruit, low tech for the everyday person walking down the street in New York City that can interact with to help them you know, understand how to best take advantage of these resources. And also reach out and complain, like, all right, my heat's not working, generate a letter for me that I could send to the management office or to NYCHA, mm -hmm. and it'll generate that letter for you in whatever language and send it out, regardless of your language barrier. You know, because the scary thing is, is that it understands your intent, right? So you could write a half a sentence and say, I want this in whatever broken grammar that you have, and it's not going to try and autocorrect you. It's going to say, you know what? I get what you need. I understand your problem. Here you go, right? And that's that's the amazing magic behind it. So it's almost like artificial emotional intelligence as well that kind of the empathy, bring, yeah, brings it back. I know people in healthcare are very excited. Um, you know, we're using it, um, but what are you seeing? Kind of since you see more than anybody else, who are you seeing from healthcare? interested so what I learned without getting into the, the the specifics of a product because I'm under a lot of different NDAs but what I learned from a doctor that we're working with is that their time spent with a patient um, if they have a 30 minute window and you know you, you might know this as well the actual patient time is about five minutes because the other 25 minutes it's spent transcribing note-taking billing you know um, sending out the orders, with the prescriptions, and he's like, if I can gain any of that time back, then that's more interaction time, FaceTime with the patient. Mm -hmm. I'm spending 
15 minutes with the patient, 20 minutes with the patient, because everything else is automated for me, and I don't have to salvage my time with the patient to, to do all the paperwork and the administrative stuff. So any of those mundane tasks in the healthcare world that we can give them back, we're, we're happy to through, through AI. The other thing that we're seeing that's still up in the air is, can you treat AI as a source of information in the healthcare space? Because there's such high risk mm. if you get that information wrong that you gotta make sure that it's trained on the right data, that you have the right experts that are checking the integrity of those outputs when it comes to AI for healthcare, for therapy. Um, so I think that's probably gonna be the last frontier in healthcare is diagnosing things because if you get it wrong, you know, there's a lot of repercussions. Sure. Well, how do you see the AI evolving? Um, multimodal, so what that term means is that it's gonna move beyond text. Uh, multimodalities means you can have text and voice and video and imagery. You know, we also also specialize in creating digital humans. So one of the ambassadors that we've created, uh, that you know, no pun intended, has taken on a life of her own, is Clara. So Clara is our virtual influencer. She's our virtual ambassador. She also gets booked to go out and speak at conferences. And the interesting with her is that she can respond in real time. So the audience can ask her questions and she responds. And she's trained as another employee of Create Labs. So she carries through our social impact mission, the importance to community and the diversity. And children love her. You know, people see her as a representative. She's an Afro-Latina AI. So the representation is, is immense. But I think she's also a snapshot of what it might be like to all have a digital human that we coexist with that is assigned roles and tasks that we are asking it to delegate to it, you know, send out these emails on my behalf, interact, take, take lead in this meeting on my behalf. You're going to see more agency. Uh, it's another catchphrase with AI, turning a chatbot into an agent. An agent is taking action on your behalf autonomously. So we're getting there, but we're still testing out the, the scalable use cases of this. And do you guys have her on W-2 or 1099? <laughs> you know, right now she's 1099. But, uh, them, them checks are coming in, so she's doing her part. Oh, good. Yeah, thank you. So finally, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs, to business leaders who are looking to incorporate AI effectively, responsibly? Um, don't run from it. It's, it's going to take over your industry. If you haven't jumped in yet, you're a little behind. Um, I would say find a moment in your team's workday where they can ideate and iterate and play with these toys and tinker. So if that means dedicating 5% of the workday, of the work week, to innovation in R&D for the entire staff, not just like one team in the sub-sub basement, um, you're going to find someone in marketing might come up with an amazing use case. Someone in HR might come up with an amazing use case. But they won't come up with those use cases if you don't put it in their hands to try it out. Yeah. You know, so that's an important part in, in making sure that everyone is encouraged to use it instead of being afraid of what it might do with your data. Just create a closed course. You know, we see commercials all the time with people doing crazy car stunts. This is on a closed course, right? So just create a closed course for, for this innovation and testing. Yeah. Well, fascinating. Thank you so much, Abram, for coming in, explaining what you're doing at Create Labs. Thank you. Thanks.